Okay, so welcome everyone to the third um, Batar Association online lecture. Uh, so today we're going to be hearing from Paramjeet Singh, CBE, uh, on Black Lives Matter, a personal reflection. Um, so the Batar Association this year, as you know, is uh, commemorating 50 years since its foundation. And uh, this year, because we've not been able to do our physical events, we've started this uh, online um, uh, lecture, uh, lecture series. So, um, and we've had several events so, uh, so far. Uh, you can see there our um, YouTube page, uh, which you can subscribe to and watch all the other videos that, that we've done. Uh, and we look for, uh, we hope you can um, uh, watch those and, and help our page grow so more people see the videos. Um, and so right now I'm going to just pass over to Jasbir Goranang, who's our immediate past president, uh, who is going to uh, introduce you to our uh, main speaker for today. Um, thank you, Kupinder, um, for that. And Sasrikal to everybody, and welcome to our lecture. I'm going to introduce Mr. Karamjeet Singh, CBE Chairman, with regards to the lecture today on Black Lives Matter. Uh, Karamjeet has a very, very impressive CV, and, and I'm going to go through every single word of it to introduce Karamjeet today. Karamjeet has been the chair of the University Hospitals of Leicester NHS Trust since the 1st of September 2014. In this time with the Trust, Karamjeet has built up considerable knowledge of the diverse communities and areas served by Leicester's hospitals. This adds to his insight from his previous employment locally as a community worker with the Leicester Community Relations Council and as an assistant county clerk with Leicestershire County Council. He is committed to ensuring Leicester's hospitals focus on providing the highest quality of experience and outcomes for patients. His previous experience of health leadership includes serving as the first chair of Coventry and Warwickshire Partnership NHS Trust from 2006 to 2009, as well as the board membership of the Coventry Family Services Health Authority from 1993 to 1996. Coventry Health Authority from 1996 to 2002, and trustee of the British Lung Foundation from 2006 to 2009. Karamji's recent voluntary commitments include being a trustee of a Sikh temple based in Co Coventry, where he lives, a council member of justice, which sponsors research and advocacy for changes in the justice system. And in June 2019, he was elected by his fellow chairs to the National Board of NHS Providers, which represents all the 231 NHS acute mental health and community services trusts in England. Garamjeet has held many diverse roles within the public services regionally and nationally during the past 40 years. So his previous national appointments have included leading the UK wide appeals process for social fund welfare benefits, appointing Queen's Council and a senior civil servant, investigating police complaints and suspected miscarriages of justice, developing training for judges, taking decisions about parole for prisoners and employment law issues, regulating financial services and the funding of political parties as well as electoral issues. He was awarded the CBE in the year 2000 for the services to the administration of justice. And in 1990, he was awarded a one year Harkness scholarship to study public policy in the United States. He was recently included in the Green Park National Survey as one of the 100 BAME business leaders. And he's also a companion of the Chartered Institute of management and a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. In November 2019, the NHS Improvements Trust appoint 
Appointments and Approvals Committee confirmed the reappointment of Karamjeet Singh, CBE, as the chair of the University Hospitals of Leicester NHS Trust until the 30th of September for the year 2022. Thank you for listening and Karamjit, welcome uh, to the Patwar Association Lectures and I'm absolutely delighted to have you on, on our program and looking forward to hear from you. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jasmeerji. Um, firstly, Sasi Kal to everyone and it's a privilege to be asked to give this uh, lecture. Uh, I'm not an academic, as you've heard. I'm a public servant who's worked in a number of different roles. And uh, this is really an opportunity to perhaps share some of my personal insights uh, to you. Um, I think that um, I'd like to start off with some brief personal reflections that I feel are kind of relevant to this uh, lecture. Um, I think the first one is, is that I think all of us tend to respond to and perceive issues through the prism of our own experiences and the values that we acquire through our own upbringings. And uh, I was born in this country. My, my father came here in 1938 from East Africa. And when we returned to India in 1948, my mother came back to the UK later that year. Now, they were migrants with few educational uh, and employment skills. So they transitioned from a Punjabi village to a British urban setting. Uh, but they were, uh, they had very strong values. They were very resilient. And these have helped to stand me in good stead through my own life journey. And it was clearly their belief in education as a route for social and economic mobility for myself and siblings that have uh, clearly led me uh, in my own role. And obviously, uh, I've had um, uh, personal experiences of growing up as a young person in the UK in the 1950s and 60s, um, which included, let me say, being taken from uh, the Midlands to the Shepherd's Bush Gurdwara, very in the early 1950s, which was only one of the two Gurdwaras in the whole of the UK at, at the time. Uh, so clearly things have changed uh, as far as our, uh, the number of Gurdwaras that we now have in the UK uh, since then. I think the other thing I just wanted to reflect on very briefly was the issue of terminology. You know, um, here we now talk about terms such as BAME, uh, communities, you know, Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. But when we, and we also talk, use words like Asian, when we all know that effectively that's a, an artificial construct. It doesn't refer to people, all the people who live in that continent. We know that that usually uh, refers to people of South Asian heritage. And we know that that in turn covers a whole myriad of different uh, communities who might identify themselves by place of origin, faith or some other linkages. And uh, the reason I've mentioned that is because what I'd like to do is perhaps in some of my comments, think about, well, what are the implications of, of Black Lives Matter for communities such as Sikhs, for example? And because that, this clearly is the audience that we're talking about today, but they can refer to other communities as well. I think Turning to the Black Lives uh, Matter mo movement, I mean, I think all of us are aware of the tragic events uh, in, in the US, which have, which have led, led to this. And I think that what, what is striking is how the tragic death of George Floyd has led to a, a rapid globalization of the Black Lives Matter movement and the outpouring of support that uh, has not been just confined uh, to the African-American or, or, or Black community. The protests have extended beyond uh, policing issues. They've covered issues now about historical injustices. And we've also seen how this in turn has moved towards reflecting on issues of symbolism, such as statues, monuments, or, or buildings. And, and this raises, I think, some interesting questions. I mean, clearly, New modes of communication, such as social media, have had an impact here. But the question to ask is, is that the whole story? Uh, how is it 
that a single tragedy incident can radicalize such a wide range of people in different settings. And then the third question I think is, what is the relevance of this issue for us as uh, Sikhs? Now, as uh, Jaswiji was saying, some 30 years ago, I was awarded uh, this scholarship. And let me say, uh, I, it was a great privilege to be awarded this because only um, uh, non-white person who'd been previously awarded this some three years before me, was uh, the Right Honourable uh, Lord Justice uh, Rabinda Singh. So it was a great honour for me to, to be able to have this. And I went to study public policy issues in the United States. And I was based at two universities in Chicago and Austin, Texas. Now, one of the issues I focused on was the relationship between urban institutions and their local communities, including police community relationships. And at the time, I, I noted how some specific incidents, such as the use of deadly force, uh, i.e. the shootings by police officers, led to uh, previous resentments welling up. And this in turn led to disorder on a large scale, uh, resulting in damage to property and sometimes loss of life. I was also in the United States when the video showing the beating of Rodney King by police officers was repeatedly shown in the media. And I think this was probably the first time that such episodes were captured visually and disseminated widely, allowing almost an instant public judgments to be made and with an immediate impact on public confidence in the police service. I think we should note that the police service is a public service that's characterized by the degree of discretion given to officers on the front line. And this is a service where you rarely have their immediate superiors being present. Now, these tensions in police community relationships have been documented for at least 60 years in the United States. And they were a key dimension in the struggle of civil rights campaigners during the 1950s and 1960s there. Similarly, if I reflect on my own experience as a commissioner of the Police Complaints Authority here in England and Wales, the relationships between police and some black communities have been characterized by mutual suspicion and tensions. Observers uh, have, have commented, and I think correctly in my view, about the relevance of the historical experiences of the African Car uh, American community in terms of their forcible transportation across the Atlantic from West Africa, the stripping of their collective and individual identity, and the unequal treatment both before and after the 1863 Emancipation Proclamation by Abraham Lincoln. Against this is the counter narrative of uh, either uh, disputing or minimizing the impact of these experiences and seeing the civil war only through the lens of experiences uh, of the fighting of, for states' rights against an overbearing federal center. I lived in the American South for six months and this provided me some very interesting insights in terms of listening to this. As an aside, uh, this phenomena of two versions of history uh, is not uh, an isolated uh, issue. Some of my previous roles have focused on uh, Northern Ireland, and there you have a society where you have two versions of history and a political narrative, which is focused on whether or not the constitutional link should be with London or Dublin. Let me, we turn now to the theme of relevance for us as Sikhs and um, begin with three episodes for our own history as a community. As Sikhs, we all know that the ninth Guru, Guru Tegh Vader, gave his life to defend the human rights of another faith community to continue to be able to continue practicing their religion as against a counter narrative of the right of rulers to forcibly convert and or oppress other faith communities. In 1849, we had the young boy Maharaja Dalip Singh, 
losing both his kingdom and also giving up uh, the Koino diamond uh, in a, an exercise of coercion. But the counter narrative, of course, was that in both cases, this was in fact a voluntary act. The third example is, of course, in 1919, where hundreds of innocent civilians were shot and killed or wounded at Jellingwell Abag. And for many, this injustice was a watershed moment, radicalizing an entire generation, including my father, who subsequently met Udham Singh when he came to this country. As we know, the counter narrative at the time and subsequently was that this action was necessary to prevent any threat to the British Empire. For communities with distinct faith or other characteristics, the experiences of unequal treatment and injustice is not therefore an isolated phenomena. In my own case, the personal insights about the issues which I've just talked about were not certainly not obtained from history lessons within uh, the British education system. As you previous years mentioned, at the present time, I'm chairing the fifth largest NHS trust in the UK with over 16,000 staff, an annual operating budget of one billion pounds and serving a diverse community of 1.3 million. All of us will have been aware of the disproportionate impact that COVID-19 has had on NHS staff and communities from BAME or different minority backgrounds. At the present time, we also have a reimposed lockdown in Leicester and some of the worst affected communities are of South Asian heritage. We have yet to receive a conclusive account for the reasons, but previous reports have already highlighted social and economic disadvantages as being relevant factors, as well as deep-seated racial inequalities. My trust board and I have been reflecting about what this means for us as an organization and for our local communities. This has led us to consider three areas. What policies could we adopt that could make a difference to the income opportunities and career opportunities open to our BAME staff, both now and in the future? Secondly, what changes to our health services could target the root causes of inequality in our communities? And thirdly, how can we work with other public, private and voluntary organizations in tackling disadvantage in education, the labor market and our physical and social environments? All these themes need to have a focus on outcomes rather than just rhetoric. To me, it is a privilege to be in this leadership position. Still, there are, since there are still relatively few people who look like me in such roles. Since 1982, I have been the most senior person of color in any organization that I've worked in. So we still have a long way to go. However, there are many economic and social entrepreneurs, professionals, and individuals with rich life experiences within our communities and no doubt within this audience that can benefit others. I believe all of us can play a role in nurturing and developing others, both within and beyond the Sikh community. In the same way, a skier leaves ski tracks behind him or her, all of us should reflect on what we can do for others. Mentoring is an obvious area and providing internship experiences is another. For me, conversations with my parents and insights from my interactions in community settings with others was very important in my own development. I've never forgotten the point from these interactions that about how you treat people, no matter what role or capacity they're in. I think the concept of SIVA, which we all recognize, is, is relevant in this context. Albert Einstein uh, once said, do not think of becoming a success, 
think of adding value. I think the relevance uh, for me, and I think the question this leads is really the question for those of us and all of us with advantages, either these are advantages in terms of our personal insights or perhaps in terms of the resources that are open to us or available to us, or the influence that we are able to share is what can we contribute to developing others? I think that the relevance of Black Lives Matter is that it should allow all of us as individuals and communities to reflect not only upon historical exp experiences, but also how we decide to face the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Karanjit Singh. Um, that's a wonderful introduction to the topic. Um, we've got a number of people on, online with us today, um, and I can see that um, uh, we've got some questions. Um, so um, maybe I can ask uh, Inder uh, to just unmute yourself and ask your question. Inderji? I think we're having a, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Sorry, we, we can't hear you. I'm just gonna ask um, uh, uh, Chenchal Chowdhury, our president, uh, just to say a few words. If you can unmute and join in. Uh, thank you, Kamjit, for your en entitled enlightening us uh, on on the Black Life Matters. Um, how do we actually measure the success of uh, the Black Life campaign? Mm. Do we see mm. as in a more opportunity for, you know, Muslim and Black or do in housing, in employment? We need to gauge it to, to see the yeah. success of it. You know, there has yeah. to be. Yeah, yeah, that's a really important, a really, really important question. I suppose what I was trying to do was to give you a reflection of my own thinking. I think that, you know, what we've seen, I, I think, are a number of things. One is we've seen this upsurge and spontaneous upsurge, uh, particularly from young people, uh, but, but uh, not exclusively young people, who have come from all over the world, have come together in demonstrations on social media. There's been this outpouring. We've also seen uh, some of that energy has focused on symbols, on statues, on, 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 on monuments, etc. But I think the issue it, we should be really focusing on, I, I believe, is really saying actually what it's drawn attention to is the systemic inequalities which we have in our societies, not just in, in the United States, but you can see this in this country also, is where, you know, black and minority ethnic communities, you know, continue to suffer uh, inequalities, whether it's in the labor market, whether it's in the housing market. Mm. I'm making a broad generalization here. If you look at disadvantage, if you look at the 10% of most deprived areas uh, in terms of wards in this country, the overwhelming majority of them will have large concentrations of minority communities. So the question is, actually, why are these deep-seated inequalities there? And actually, what can we do about them? Now, I personally believe that this is a really important issue, which Black Lives Matter movement has, has, has highlighted. It's not that people didn't know about, about this before, but I believe that this is an opportunity to put fresh energy into that. Now, what I'm also saying is that I do not believe that this is simply a matter for public authorities to focus on spending, you know, uh, money from public taxation or, or investment from private enterprise. That is important. I also believe that we should be focusing on what is it that we, who are relatively advantaged within our communities, what can we do individually and collectively? I do believe that we have a, a responsibility there. I hope that just 
gives you my thinking on it. Well, you know, recently, I think in the last couple of days, we came to know that in New South Wales, in Australia, mm. they're rebranding it as a Black Lives and the indigenous population matters. So mm. I, I think there is a danger of diluting the whole message. I think Black Lives, is, you know, as you said, is the BAME, is all the minorities and ethnic minorities. It encompasses everything. If we start adding more, more into it, I think then we say, well, well, George Floyd did say something and the campaign is something, but yes, we have to add these, but really it is for all minorities, for all equality, is it not? Yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 I believe actually, I mean, I have no, I think we have to recognize that, that in, in the United States, and I had a, a year and a real opportunity to talk to a wide range of people. It really um, gave me a lot of insight into this. The historical experience of the African-American community in the United States, you know, is a historical one. And it's rooted in slavery and, 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 and that is not to minimize that issue. What I was trying to say in some of my comments was that actually, you know, we have other communities. We have our communities, for example, as, as Sikhs. You know, we have multiple identities, but but we have we have the experience of colonialism that that uh, and and that experience and has led to, let's be frank, that has led to the migration of people to this country as a direct result of that colonial experience. Now, the fact is that the inequalities, both historically and the inequalities that people have faced here, there's absolutely no reason why the themes in Black Lives Matter cannot, you know, transcend the African-American community. And I think what, for me, what's been really striking is that actually, you know, when I was in the United States 30 years ago, the concerns about police community relations tended to come and be restricted solely to black communities. What I think is really interesting about Black Lives Matter is that you can see this visually, you can see the, the kind of very wide spectrum of people who are drawn into it. And I suppose what I'm saying is, if that's happening, that's a really interesting issue. The other issue is, well, you know, the, the issue of the uh, racial uh, inequalities that are, that are here, both in this country and elsewhere, actually don't just affect black communities, they do affect other communities as well. And we therefore need, there is no reason why we can't be applying the Black Lives Matter movement and thinking about it in, in applying it to other uh, communities. But also what we should be focusing on is what is the relevance of this to us as, as uh, uh, public organizations? And what I was trying to talk about is how, for example, in my organization, you know, we employ 16,000 people we are probably the largest employer in, in my local community. Therefore, we have a responsibility to think about what can we do, you know, to, to, to actually make the life opportunities of our local communities better. Uh, Bupinder, are there any questions? Otherwise, I'll <laughs> just mention so something. Uh, we've got a question from uh, Indraji. If just please click on unmute and... Uh, He's a very prominent uh, personality. He's yeah, a patron of our organization. And so he's served uh, on health board and, you know, community national health. Okay. Indraji, yeah. are you there? Yeah. Taranji Singh Ji, first of all, I'm very sorry. I have not been able to listen to your lecture before. I've just been able to just now. So I don't know the gist of it, but I can understand what you would have said. Keeping this thing in view, two questions to you, please. Yeah. First, yep. you say that uh, black life matters. Where do the other brown lives and white lives, uh, lives stand? Have you got some views on it? Second thing is this, Sikh people have been very much discriminated against over here as well as in America. And uh, don't you think their lives matters? So I'm saying this thing because I have not been able to listen to your lecture before. Yep. So I'm yep. very original. I don't yeah. know whether know me or not. Yeah. We know 
Well, I, 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 I think what I'm saying, uh, I was saying, uh, and very quickly to distill it, is, is, is uh, of course, the fact that we have uh, a slogan which has been globalised, you know, the Black Lives Matter, there is absolutely no reason why that I'm saying that slogan can't apply to other communities. And I certainly don't disagree with the issue that Sikhs, um, of course, Sikhs have been discriminated uh, uh, here and, and in uh, North America. Uh, uh, so that's not a not an issue. So uh, I'm sorry you didn't hear what I said, but certainly I was making the point. What I was trying to do was to really say that that actually what is interesting is that how this is spread beyond uh, not just the African Caribbean community, not just in North America, it has become a global issue, and also how it is spread to not only just thinking about police community relationships, but also historical injustices, such as slavery. And really what I was saying is actually, you know, it is interesting that of course, every, everything like this produces a counter narrative. And of course there are counter narratives of people who are seeking to minimize, uh, minimize this. And I was also in my lecture trying to sort of uh, just illustrate the point that actually, uh, you know, as a community, we've seen, you know, in Sikh history, how there have been counter narratives to really quite important uh, events, really, that have happened in, in our history. I think that that, so therefore it's not, that's not a unique process in, in my view. I'm not an academic, I'm just simply making that in terms of what I've read and thought about these issues. If you are not academic, who else is? I know you for the last 30 years, when I was community relations officer of Hounslow, you were in Leicester. So well, I was, yeah. you have got I, I, very I'm highly, you have got two daughters, all of them are PhDs, they have Japanese language, they must, and then you say you are not academic. <laughs> but okay. Indaji, how do you see, you know, your days in, uh, in Hounslow race relations, you were the top person we knew at our our origin, but how do you see the movement now compared to your time when you were uh, the head of race relation? And of course, IWA days, you know, Piara Khabra and, you know, other, other people. How do you see this now? To, to whom I'm are asking you? the question to you, yes. I'm just oh. asking your question. Yeah. Well, well uh, you probably know that in the past, everybody used to be called blacks. You know that. In, uh, right up to 1981 census, everything, there were two categories. One is white and black. And I campaigned against it that identity of Asians should also be recognized. Got in touch with the Commission for Racial Equality. They wouldn't listen to me at all. Then I had to write an article in the newspaper. As a result of that, there was a global campaign. Then from 91 census onwards, there were separate categories uh, for Sikhs and Hindus and Muslims and uh, uh, black people also. But now what has happened, these brown people have just eclipsed. They are not, everybody's calling black, black, black. So as a result of that, I would really like to know that the plight's situation of Asian should also be highlighted. We should be recognized as well as particularly Sikhs also. I don't have to repeat it, what has been happening in America about them. Thank you, Ji. We got a question from uh, Gurdeep Chadda. Oh, sorry, Gurdeep can we Ji? please go to just Beer Anand first? She's been waiting for some okay. time. Okay. Thank you. If you can unmute, please. Yes, thank you, Papinder. Uh, thank you, President Saab. Can, can I just say, is it a big welcome when the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, actually announced a commission to review and improve the diversity across London, especially in our public realms, to ensure that the capital's landmarks suitably reflect um, mm. achievements and diversity. And of course, yeah. if we're looking at diverse public realm, we'll need to focus on actually increasing the representation from Black, Asian, and ethnic minority communities. Would you say that this should be rolled out across England so that these uh, commissions could be commissioned everywhere so that could reflect the contribution of the black 
and ethnic minorities in this country, which I think yeah. has been left behind over many years and the inequalities and disproportionates uh, that have been lingering in the background. I think for me, the, the, the mayor's announcement was an icing on the cake while all this was happening in America. Would you say you'd welcome it? And would yeah. you say that it should yeah. be rolled out across the country? Yeah, no, I, I, look, I, I, I welcome anything which, which gives, uh, and I'd link it to what uh, Indajit was saying. I think, I think that, you know, the, the fact is what's really important is that we need to recognize the contribution of people. You know, I, you know, I, I, you know, I mean, this is a personal thing, but, but uh, as, as uh, Gentil Du knows, I mean, I, I was really fortunate that my father took the time to, at my coaxing, to sit down and write his life story. The fact is, we've had a whole generation who have come here, made sacrifices, and, and there is very little, you know, oral history, and, 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 but there are also, the fact is that what's coming through now in the same way that we know that there are concerns about how certain monuments, how institutions were funded through slavery, we equally know how much of it, uh, so much of it was funded from money which uh, came from, uh, you know, South Asia. So, so I think that I, I, you know, so I, uh, and, and then if we reflect on individuals who have made contributions, there are individuals. I mean, today the reason we have moved from having two good brothers to say over three hundred in the Sikh community is because you had individuals in those communities who actually spent the time. Now these are people who are uh, not known, unspoken, and 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 there are people. They also there are people who made great contributions not only within the Sikh community, but actually reached out and made contributions in their local communities. And, and of course, we should be celebrating this uh, because actually the people who come after us, our younger generation, they need to um, see and reflect, of the, reflect on this. And when I was making these comments and I gave these three examples from, from, from uh, you know, the history of, of Sikhs, as it were, I certainly didn't get this consciousness from um, my own education in the British education system, I got it because of my own reading and conversing with my parents, who who gave me a, a different world view. It is really important uh, for our young people. Open that just one finally before I go. Um, we're also um, looking at renaming uh, the Havelock Gurdwara, which is the largest out of India in Europe. Mm -hmm the name, renaming of the road to Gunanak Road to Gunanak Way. And I'm taking a mm. report to Cabinet on the 16th of July to actually take permission to actually go and do this. We hope to do this by November when the Kurburam kicks in. I think mm. it's really to ensure that history is celebrated and commemorated in a very appropriate way across Absolutely. England. Thank Absolutely. you. I well, just mentioned before I take another question, and you mentioned you say history, you didn't get a sense of your history through the British system. But even Indian history doesn't talk about Dalit or untouchability. I mean, people no. have suffered. So, you know, there is always a problem with education. I think yeah. the next question is actually from Gurdeep Chadda, please, Gurdeep Ji. If you please unmute and ask your question. Thank Gurdeep. you very much. Um, Thank you very much, Karamjit, for your really very enlightening talk. Um, you yourself have said, and we agree, that you've been holding very privileged positions. Um, what I'd like to do, a couple of comments. One is, is, in your view, how would you encourage members of the BIM community mm. to, to push themselves forward to take yeah. positions in, uh, for example, in the police force, in, mm. um, in, in, in the justice system. Mm. Um, and the second um, uh, question I have is, uh, as you are the chairman of the hospital trusts, is, mm. and, and you're aware, and we all are aware of the high number of deaths that have taken place mm. amongst the mm. communities, is what is mm. your observation on this, please? Thank you. Yeah, 
Well, thank you. There two, two really important questions. I think the first one is the point, again, and I apologise if I didn't make this more clear in my lecture. I, I believe each of us, each of us should be really trying to uh, mentor and encourage uh, people to put themselves forward. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, I, I do this. I, I um, uh, try and speak to uh, young people, even people in mid-career, if people come to me with with advice, I, I think that's something we should all be trying to do in terms of trying to in, encourage people. I think that what is interesting in some communities, you see your associations that have been set up quite explicitly to try and encourage people to, you know, be more ambitious. I, I have to uh, tell you that, um, you know, when I was growing up, I had no concept. I went to my local university, you know, Warwick University, I had no concept that there were universities like Oxford or Cambridge. That's not a criticism of my parents. That's simply because of how things were. And, and you know, I, 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 don't, I don't in any sense regret that at all. That's just the way it was. But we need to be encouraging, uh, you know, our youngsters in our, in our community. So we need to think about SEVA in that kind of way, helping to broaden young people's horizons is, is something I think we can all do. We can all do, I think. On, On the second slide, Kar Karamjit, you know, just, I just wondering, I just recollect from your dad's book, hmm. he met Krishna Menon, that's in the yeah. 40s when India was struggling for the freedom. Um, yeah. And your dad helped him with, you know, small shillings or whatever in those days was. And then he kept in touch with him and he also went to lead some other time, devoting his time and everything. My question is. Yeah, sorry. You know, can later I, on, can after I just finish the, partition, the second question? Sorry, sir, Chanji, Gentle, you can, may I finish the second question for. Sorry. Uh, could be, yeah? sorry, I thought if I, I may, sorry. Uh, I think on the second issue, uh, look, I, I, the, the thing is, this is a really serious issue. You know, when you think that 21% uh, of the staff, NHS staff, in, doctor, in terms of doctors, are from BAME communities. And yet, the, the numbers, uh, the percentage of BAME doctors who made up the, the BAME doctors who, uh, the doctors in general who passed away during COVID-19 is 63%. In other words, three times as much. Now, you know, this is really concerning. And this raises questions about people working on the front line. The fact that perhaps people who are more senior to them, you know, uh, were not necessarily working on the front line. It may raise issues about you know, susceptibility in genetic terms. There are so all, all sorts of issues. One thing that has come out of this is that all BAME staff, including in my hospital trust, are now being individually risk assessed in terms of the roles they are in, the likelihood of them coming into contact with people with COVID-19. And I think that one of the issues this throws up is actually that uh, the roles that people get assigned to in other words, what type of career development do they get or do they get being put into and pigeonholed in certain roles? So I think that there are some longer term issues which are coming out of this exercise as well. Gentle, yes, sorry. If I, I, sorry, I rudely interjected there, but I wanted to... Sorry, no, no, I, I thought you finished. Yeah. Uh, my yeah. question was a helping, you know, you said, you know, we should yeah. help each other. My question was really, uh, yeah. Krishna Menon, he became yeah. the first... Uh, uh, um, high commissioner here yeah. and later on yeah. when he went back to India he became cabinet minister rising to finance minister at one time I think. Yeah. Uh, did he ever help you know the community or your dad in any way did he keep in touch with with you you know with your dad I, 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 well my father doesn't talk about I mean he talks about him coming to Coventry um, corresponding with my father and, and uh, some of his colleagues. They were very active in the Indian Works Association. I mean, remember, this was during the war. So this was the period yes. 1940 to 45. That's so right. this was when there were relatively few people here, uh, but they were very focused on uh, agitating for Indian independence. So, so, and he was obviously very active in what was then the India League, which was, I think, very much um, an association of, of professionals and, and so forth. Whereas people like my father and his colleagues were, you know, really in 
in uh, working in factory jobs. So you really had a, uh, and for them, many of them, uh, obviously English was, was, they weren't particularly fluent, but it was interesting that he continued to correspond. He continued to come when he was invited and he kept in touch. And certainly when he became high commissioner, he certainly invited a number of people to come and see him. So that's how he, he tried to keep in touch. Uh -huh. Are there any, Har, Harbir has a question, please, Harbir Singh. If you please unmute and ask a question. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, Mr. Karmji Singh, uh, uh, fascinating talk. And as you mentioned, it's a question of outcomes are very yeah. important, not rhetoric. And yeah. certainly your idea of mentoring is, I think, very important. That everybody should pass on the experience and motivate other people. So on this question, I mean, in your life, which is very successful, what motivated you? And what brought um, you into this field in your personal life? Uh, and what problem yeah, did you I can just, uh, Well, I can give you one example. It, it, um, my father uh, sponsored, I think, nearly 40 people uh, uh, to come to this country, you know, and, and um, you know, there were people, most of them were people from Punjabi villages. They, they had very little, uh, very little Punjabi, let alone English, in terms of uh, their ability to read and write. So they would come to him. Uh, he himself actually left school in the eighth grade. So, but but he 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 was fluent in English. He was right. And he said to me when I was fourteen years old, they used to come to him, and and he would write everything for them. When I was fourteen, he said to me, "You are now going to take this role over." And he says, uh, "There are three points you have got to remember uh, when people come. The first point is that when they come." You firstly ask them politely whether they uh, want a cup of tea or a cup of water or whatever. You sit down. The second thing you remember is, is that you write down what they tell you, neither more or less. You simply write down what they tell you. And linked to that is that you never share that information with anyone else. Mm. And the third thing he said, and this is very important, he said, he said, simply because you understand English and they don't, you are not to consider yourself as being superior to them. You talk to them in Punjabi, you converse with them, you talk to them about their life and their insights, and you will learn something from them. You are starting on your life journey. These people are well advanced and you will learn. I've never forgotten that lesson. And I've always, I think what that made me realize that, that there was a brief period when I was briefly interested in politics and I had this conversation with my father and he said well look he said it'll be at least 20 years before he says someone who looks like you will become a an MP and he says my advice to you is is that actually if you are interested in public service then you finish your education and you you try and work in uh, public services he said I have no contacts I cannot tell you I'm working in a factory, so you will have to make your own way. And I think that was really, for me, that was a really, uh, I reflect on it now, and I, and I think the skills and the mentoring he gave me, and, and uh, I think confidence he gave me, um, meant that uh, I did that. I have to tell you, I've never been promoted anywhere. I've simply just moved from one role to another. I've always responded to advertisements no one has ever said to me, this is an opening uh, uh, or tapped me on the shoulder. I've really had to make my own way. And of course, there are some times I've applied, I've not been successful, but you have to learn to be resilient in, in, in that sense. So that is the advice that I personally would want to kind of share and experiences I try and share with anyone who, who asks me for my advice. You know, we, we have to learn to make our way, but it does help. <laughs> if you have people who try and give you some insights that you can draw on in terms of uh, how you chart your course. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. But, but just on, on a similar point, obviously you're looking brown rather than black and Afro-Caribbean does help, you know, since you're coming to black lives. I think the brown guys have had an easier time because basically if you look English, go for a pint of beer, play golf, tennis, and out of the circle, and your promotion is that much faster. 
Mm. I mean, would you say yeah. it's the black well, black people haven't got the networks to survive? No, in America no, and, 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 and and you know, I you're, you're right, and I I didn't have those networks. I I don't play golf. Uh, I don't drink as it happens. So I'm not a, a pub going person. And and I think that uh, I think you know w- what I have learned, what I did learn, and this is just by observing my father's generation. And these were people who, you know, who came from villages and they came into an urban setting, is that, is that they supported each other. They supported each other and that was their survival. But they also, I think, learned. Uh, now, they actually worked in factories and they basically probably remained in those factories for most of their working lives. I think in my case, I simply... Uh, sought out opportunities elsewhere and when I felt I'd learned enough and um, if I felt I'm not going to get any promotion here it was very risky uh, very risky strategy you know after two or three years I moved on and did something else you know but but again uh, what also starts to happen is that when you uh, particularly at national level you are seen to do a, a good job and you apply then clearly, you know, your references, et cetera, start to, to work in, in, uh, and help you. Um, I mean, just to give you one, and sometimes you take risks. I mean, I served for 10 years as a commissioner on the UK Electoral Commission, you know, and uh, I volunteered in addition to my UK responsibilities to become the Electoral Commissioner for Northern Ireland. Now, I did that because I felt I've worked in uh, urban areas in, in, in the UK. I had some understanding of uh, divided communities. And actually, I thought I could apply those insights there. So, you know, I, I, I think you have to kind of also think about, well, this, could, this challenge it could well be turned into an opportunity. No, Thank you. Uh, I mean, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. But I'm just saying, we, we Rishi, Su- Rishi Sunak and you and others are like white Englishmen. But for a black guy, <laughs> or somebody looking very different, yeah. he may not fit the picture to be at the next prime minister. I mean, that well, is my yeah. point. Okay, Harbir, thank you. I think thank next you. question Next question we have is from Rami, please. <clears throat> Rami, can you unmute and ask the question? Hi, thanks very much. Sasekalji, thank you for Sasekalji. a wonderful, uh, wonderful, informative uh, presentation. What my question was, if we look at the younger generation who are in school right now Hmm. how much influence or value do you see in integration overall between our communities and BAME communities within the wider white society or do you see integration doesn't play as an influential role as perhaps sometimes it's commented in 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 papers uh, yeah, uh, um, look, I'm, I'm not a sociologist um, and I wouldn't pretend to be, but I, I do believe, in, in my, and I give my own, if you like, personal experience, we, you know, we, 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 it, this is not a binary issue. This is, um, for me, you know, look, I, I, I enjoy, used to enjoy playing rugby when I was at school. Uh, Saturday afternoon, I, I, uh, in the past, perhaps I've, I've been and watched a local rugby team, Wasps, I'm a Wasp fan. On Sunday mornings, you know, I'm in a totally different uh, setting. I go to the local Gurdwara, I have to be a trustee, and it's a Punjabi-speaking uh, context, as it were. All of us have learned, we've all learned, haven't we, to navigate different cultural boundaries, linguistic boundaries, uh, etc. I mean, that may be a definition of integration. I don't, I don't know. But I, I do think that actually, you know, opening our minds and behaving in a way that actually, you know, and I personally believe this is one thing about, you know, Sikhism. I, I personally believe that, um, that, that actually, you know, it is possible to have a, a very open-minded approach to this. I, I think, you know, this question of whether it's BAME communities or, you know, the wider, wider public, I, you know, we, all of us are human beings. We all have to kind of, uh, you know, I, I think we 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 have to recognize that that um you can't stereotype an entire community one of the things i do uh think is 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 relevant here 
in terms of Black Lives Matter and the discourse is that we do have to recognize that historically that there have been very, very few people until relatively recently of BAME backgrounds who've been in real positions of authority and who, you know, you can say actually are more reflective of the wider population. We still have a long way to go. So I think that's that. What I don't think and I don't believe is helpful for you know um, us as a community or any other community to try and um, uh, become so inward looking that, that they try and limit, that we limit our contacts with the wider society. I, I do not believe that's right. I think it's really important and I really applaud this. And I think you can see this in our communities, for example, you know, the youngsters, I see this in the Midlands, and I'm sure it's the same there in London. You know, I see youngsters whose parents and grandparents were factory workers, and they are now working in the city, or they're working in, you know, uh, senior positions um, in the law, in the professions, in medicine, etc. And And indeed, you know, we've now got more people who've gone into... Um, politics and and they've made a real real uh, difference i think you know there's something that the previous questioner said about about people looking and speaking like englishmen well you know that may be the case people may look and look at you like that but actually you know how you decide to run your life and live your life and what values you have i think is likely to be very much a product of the way you've been brought up you know I don't know uh, if that helps. That's just a, a, a stream of consciousness on my part. Thank you. Yeah, no, that does. That does. That's really helpful. I think that uh, coupled with your earlier statement at the beginning around the beneficial or the benefits of mentoring mm. and giving advice and helping people, perhaps in exchange yeah. Yeah. of events and activities with a wider range of communities, then then we, it, we're really coming up with some good ingredients to, to hopefully... Um, you know, help the future generations and see yeah. less of what we're what we've seen in the past. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 We are nearly coming to the end of our program. But just one thing: going back to your dad's book, um, I like you to you know say something. Uh, your experience visiting Shepherd Bush Gurdwara. I think, if I remember correctly, my reading of the book, you were renamed there. Yes, How I was. old were you? How old were you and what was the need? Yeah, well, the, the, the thing was that what, what happened was that when I was, I was born, obviously, in those days, you, you had to have your name on the birth certificate, I understand, within six weeks. I mean, you'll, 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 you'll have to remember, of course, that all this was kind of written by my father. You know, I would right. okay. six weeks, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know. Oh, but, I see. Okay. But the, you the had a name was, there. So yeah. I couldn't. Couldn't yeah. collect. No, what no, no. My that? name, my name there was was Sukminda. But but you so know my right, father, something. my father and, and and mother, you know, were very, you know, were, were, you know, were, were very um, wedded to you know Sikh principles and Sikh religion. And indeed, you know, my father was one of the founders of of the GMP Sikh temple in Coventry. Now, the, the issue was that there were only two Gurdwaras in the whole of the UK. Uh, yeah. So when I was about three. When I was about three or I think four, they took me, they took my younger sister and my brother who had uh, just been born and I think was about six months old. They took the three of us there and they, they clearly had the ceremony where, you know, you open the Guru Granth Sahib That's and right. you look at the first letter. And that letter was a kukka, which is why, yeah. you know, Karanjit uh, uh, was a name that they... Um, obviously uh, blessed me with and and that's the name that i've adopted ever since ever since uh, then but so my passport says karamjit sukhminder singh because okay because uh, my but that you know my couldn't we couldn't change my birth certificate but uh, but that you know that but i think that that again is is just an issue of i think an example of really how in those circumstances uh, people with limited resources you know, wanted to reaffirm their own sense of identity, as it were. And, and in those days, you know, uh, there were very, very few uh, Sikh families. But the know? reason I said Shepherd Bush, because we got uh, 
and you know a gentleman here who dedicated 50 years of his life to Shapur Push Gurdwara. Wrong. And I like Wrong. him to say at least hello, uh, Rajinder ji. To see Rajinder ji, yes, can sir, you unmute him, Pupinder? Yes, yes he's sir. a gentleman who spent 50 years in uh, in serving Shapur Push Gurdwara. He retired right. last right. year. So say something to uh, Karamji ji. And I'm very really glad to hear all that you said there. And when you mentioned Shepherd River yeah. because I'm attached to River for more than 55 years. Right. Well, I find it. Sure. Anything comes from the Gurdwara or along the Gurdwara, I'm glad to hear. So, as you said, there was the first Gurdwara in the country. Yeah. And, you know, I'm glad that well, our ancestors, even uh, yeah. when they established, and uh, the head Granthi of the Gurdwara was my headmaster in Amrasa. So, oh, right. So, okay. therefore, they had to give me more to into the Gurdwara. And luckily, I've been serving there for a long, long time. Yeah. And therefore, uh, that is well known. Uh, we are doing very well even these days. You know, we have uh, Punjabi classes. We have Kirtan classes there. And we give 45 minutes on the top period for the mm. children to sing in hymns. Mm. And one of our dedicated lady who is really dedicated to teach them they are not only kids and these days they form the Zoom, they are also teaching and reading Guru Granth mm. So that uh, gives me uh, this happiness to see that how mm. this Gurdwara is imparting more knowledge to the uh, common six there. Yeah, it's a historical Gurdwara. I mean, my father talks about first going there when he arrived in London in October 1938. I mean, and, and he talks about that. And he talked about um, uh, a gentleman, uh, I, I'm trying to think of his name, you know, who was from a Sharpa district, because we originally are from a Sharpa district. Mm -hmm. And he, he, you know, talks about how during the war, he would uh, occasionally go there. And uh, again, as I say, in the 1950s, it was only when in Smedic, in a school, they started to celebrate uh, on a monthly basis that uh, he and my mother uh, started going there. But until then, until the mid 1950s, they would they would try and come down to Shepherd's Bush Gurdwara when they could. So, so you know, things have clearly moved on. So, a very historical good one. Are you still in touch with uh, your village Dadial now or not? Yes, yes. I, 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 um, I uh, uh, t three years ago, I renovated the, the house in the village that my great grandfather built in 1940 um, with the first money that my father sent back um, from his uh, earnings here. You know, so. Um, uh, that, that is Ram really, Singh. Ram Singh was your great grandfather? No, my he was my grandfather. A grandfather. Uttam great Singh. grandfather Uttam was Ram Singh, Singh, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. But Uttam Singh was was my great grandfather, That's and right. he he built the house, and and uh, so um, you know, so again, it, it's because we we had those links. Uh, my um, my 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 late wife, uh, she deceased now. You know, uh, came from the Punjab. She was first generation, and. You know, we kept those links and, um, you know, obviously um, very much. I grew up speaking Punjabi, obviously very fluently. And, and we've tried with both children and grandchildren to keep that link. Thank you. It's been a fascinating journey. And, and, you know, just like your dad's book. Thank you very much for enlightening us on this thing. It's been really a pleasure. I pass it on to Bupinder for his final words. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that enlightening talk. And uh, we've had quite a good discussion going along uh, as well. Um, and uh, all I wanted to, to really end by is uh, really encouraging everyone to um, get involved with the Patar Association. Uh, we have a, a, a website and uh, all of our events are, are uh, marketed on the website. And we also have a, a regular newsletter. So please do visit the website www.thebatar.com and also uh, do subscribe uh, and watch all of our other videos. Uh, 
Um, so thank you all for taking part and thank you very much, Karamjit Singh, for your thank you very uh, wonderful much. talk today. Yeah. Thank you.